How are you a good Muslim and nobody likes you? How? How does that work? At the time of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even his enemies had respect for him. Some of his enemies had respect for him. Yes or no? And when I find Muslims who don't have respect even for their own scholars and teachers, I'm wondering what's going on? What is this? Where's the proper behavior? One of the things that happens is the boob tube. But you start watching that thing and you watch these scenarios that they fabricate and put on there and you start thinking that's how people really are. And one of the things that we notice more than anything else is the bad treatment given to parents in most of these programs. And that's not new. That didn't just happen last week. That's been going on since the 1930s, before there was television. All the way back to the time of Dagwood Bumstead, Dagwood and Blondie, they always showed him, the father of the house, the leader of the family, as a real dim bulb, a real yo-yo, a schmuck. They did. And it was funny. Everybody would make fun of that. And then they had programs about it. And they had the little kid is always the smart one, Dennis the Menace. The kid is always the brilliant one. The parents are stupid. The kid's real sharp. And he's putting them down to the extent today that they just start right out. The very first joke they got is the kid going, Oh, what a yo-yo. And everybody's uh, 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 laughing. <coughs> Judaism, Christianity, and Islam forbid that. They forbid that. In fact, it's an order in all three of the monotheistic religions that the parents are so high, so high that they're mentioned in the commandments in this priority. After God, Almighty Allah, worship Him alone and keeping religion pure for Him and staying away from false worship and worshiping according to His rules, that's the first four commandments. Number five in the commandments is how you treat your parents. It comes before number six, which is don't kill. It's exactly the same order in the Quran, no difference. So regardless of what your take is on which religion, on which book, I think all of us need to go back and look and think, what are we doing? How could we possibly treat our elders as we do today? How could we even make jokes? It's not acceptable to put down your mother, to put down your father to talk about your elders, your teachers, regardless of their religious affiliation, regardless of their political minds, they're your parents, and you have to give them that dignity. Am I wrong or right? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. They wanted me to talk about how the West needs Islam. I'm saying all of us need it. I'm saying that it's not something that's like an obscure thing for one area here or there. I'm saying if you're a human being, how can you live without Islam? How? And most people on the earth have some points of Islam in their life and they don't know it. Is that true or false? It's true. Think about it. If somebody is willing to put the other person ahead of their needs, is that a teaching in Islam? If somebody is willing to sacrifice from themselves to help somebody else, is this Islam? Yes. If somebody is going to feed somebody in the day of need, or take care of the orphan, or the traveler, the wayfarer, is that part of Islam? Yes. It may be that they don't have the right beliefs, but how about the actions? And when we find that there are so many people who want to do something good, they have an idea. How about this? Instead of cutting them down to the level of, okay, because you don't believe what I believe, you're totally wrong. How about emphasizing the good that people do and encourage them to do more? Okay, you've got a good deed here. How about let's add to that? I mentioned something last night, but I'll mention it again, that sometimes we find people of other faiths who start hanging around the Muslims 
and even to the extent that they, they like what they hear, they like what they see, they feel good when they're with you because you're a good Muslim, you don't drink alcohol, you don't smoke cigarettes, you don't play with drugs, you don't chase after women. And as long as these things are in place, especially you don't cut people down, you don't make somebody feel like low, they feel good. They want to be with you. To the extent that when you want to do salah, they want to pray. They want to stand and pray with you. When you're fasting, they want to fast with you. So you ask them, well, why don't you become a Muslim? What? No. No, 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 no. But they're still doing some good deeds, yeah? But we come back to this same thing again to remind them that as much as your good deeds that you're doing, how about this idea? How about enroll in the program to get the benefits? How about sign up huh, for the job so you can get paid on payday? Make sense? If you're going to do all this good stuff anyway, what is it to enter Islam? It is to say with conviction that there really is God. One God. And that you want to worship Him on His terms. That's the very beginning. That's the first step. Immediately followed by the second step to bear witness that Muhammad brought the message that I just said. That there is one God and you need to do what he wants you to do. What is so tough about this for somebody who already claims to believe in the monotheistic faith? And the answer comes that people say, well, this is what I grew up in. This is what I found my forefathers doing. I'm committed to this because my family is this, my tradition is this, and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in the Quran. This is exactly the excuse that people use. But it's not a valid excuse. It is ignorance because if you know something will benefit you more than what you have, why can't you abandon that for what's better for you? Why not? And I'm going to wrap it up by telling you what happened to me. When I was trying to convert the Muslim to Christianity. When it comes to debating, I considered myself pretty good at it. I used to do it. I used to love to debate any subject. It didn't have to be about religion. What do you want to debate? I take either side. I enjoyed it. And he could tell I'm trying to convert him. And at one point he says, my religion, Islam, teaches me that if I find something better than what I have, I have to go for that. I said, what? He said, yeah. Whatever we have, if we find something better, we leave what we have and take what is better. I got him. I said, you mean to tell me that if you find a better religion, you go to it. He said, yeah, if there's a better religion, I'll go to it. <laughs> I got him. Because Christianity, you don't have to fast, what is it, 30 days in Ramadan? You don't have to pray five times a day. You don't have to go to Mecca. You don't have to do a pilgrimage. You don't have to pay something called zakat. In fact, you don't even have to be nice to be a Christian. You should, but it's not a mandate. The mandate is to say Jesus died for your sins. That's the big thing. And he's the son of God. That's easy. And when I said that to him, he said, well, I'll go to your religion if your religion's better than mine. But you need proof. Said, proof? Uh, excuse me. Religion is not about proof. Religion is about faith. He said in Islam we have both faith and proof. I said, you mean to sit there and tell me as a Muslim you can prove there's God? He said, you mean to sit there and tell me as a preacher you can't? Uh, 
What was the question? <laughs> Who? Now I'm curious. I got to know. I got to know. What is the proof that there is God? Because actually I've wanted to know that all my life. I know there's God, but I don't have any proof. I just know it. But how? I, I, I can't imagine a time when I didn't believe there was God. Really. I remember back in the 1960s, mid-60s, about the time of the motorcycle gangs that were going over to the hippie thing with the flower children and all that stuff. Life magazine came out with a special edition and on the front of it said, God is dead. And I went, oh, huh? Can you imagine a grown-up doing that? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a real gopher, you know, and say, oh, God, what happened? Where's the obituary pages in this thing? And it was some kind of nonsense article, but it, it got my attention. This, uh, it, it's something that, you know, people speculate a lot of things about God, offer this and offer that, and they come up with some real weird ideas, but nobody ever talks about the proof that God exists. We have a website that you can go to and get a lot of evidence. It's called scienceislam.com. On it, we have videotape of nine different scientists, well known in their fields and in their particular disciplines. They studied what the Quran is saying about the way the earth is structured, the way the mountains are, about the where milk comes from in a cow between a conjunction of the blood and the intestines, mentioning about the bees, mentioning details about how the human embryo is formed, how it grows, the trimesters, so many things that they studied. And remember, these are not Muslims. In fact, they're atheists. But it, each one of them at the end of the video said, what I found from this seminar or convention that they were having, and for, there was about the Quran. It, it, there's no way 1,400 years ago somebody said these things. Couldn't have been. Could not have been. And some of them said, well, it must be from Allah. And one of them, standing while he was giving his talk, two and a half minutes into it, he said, I guess it's time for me to say, Ashadu la ilaha illallah. Ashadu Muhammad Rasulullah. This came out in the 1980s. And by the late 1990s, it became a popular notion amongst a lot of the scientists, not a majority, but a lot of them around the world, that they need to go back and re-look and reinvestigate a lot of the things they've been saying. And some of them came up with the idea, they didn't want to say there's God, but they did come with a new thing. I don't know if you heard about it. ID, intelligent design. They're saying there's some intelligence behind the design, but they don't want to go further than that. They don't want to lose their fellowship or they don't want to lose their you know, positions that they have with different universities because you can get cut off at the knees real quick. Just intelligent design. What I'm saying, though, is proof. Proof. If you want to know about proof, some things could be right in front of your face. And we used to say you can't see the forest because the trees are in the way. And that's the way a lot of us are. Yeah, the West needs Islam, but I'm telling you all of us need Islam. But we need to understand what Islam really is. So let's put a cap on it with this. The word Islam is coming from a verb, aslama, and it carries these five things. Surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace. That if a person will really surrender to God and really submit to his commandments and then obey those commandments in sincerity, then be at peace with whatever comes, then he'll be in Islam and in Arabic he'd be a Mu Islam, Muslim. It's as simple as that. It's not that complicated. And by the way, as I mentioned earlier in the program, about these prophets. In fact, they are at peace. They are at peace with whatever comes to them. A true Muslim is content with what Allah gives them. And he's also content with what he doesn't get as well. We should be happy that we don't get cancer, tuberculosis, broken legs, 
We should be happy that we don't get robbed. 